Good morning, students. Um, today, we are going to navigate through lecture five of the ARCG325 housing course entitled the ground floor interface and facade composition. This is a um, topic that it's very important for uh, architecture students because after we discuss how the dwellings can be organized and stacked vertically or horizontally to compose a building, um, we need to focus on these two aspects that are um, the ground floor and the facade. Why? Because um, the ground floor has complexities uh, that the other floors uh, don't have. I mean, we already addressed in lectures three and four what are the complexities of the dwelling or of composing the building. And you already uh, know it, uh, hopefully. But when it comes to the ground floor, this is not a common floor in the building. Uh, it is a floor that mediates the transition between public and private but also that has to host many services and facilities that don't exist on the other floors. And so um, there is generally a conflict that has to be solved on, especially in, uh, of, let's say, residents, visitors, passers-by, and all the technical services uh, or let's say technical people that have to access the building uh, in uh, different times. Um, then the second point that we are going to discuss is the facade composition because um, if it is true um, that in architecture the facade should be a reflection of uh, should be integrated with the project, meaning the plans, the sections, the elevations. I mean, the facade is not a separated entity from the rest of the design. It is also true that in dwelling design or housing design, to be more correct, um, this um, has to be an independent topic because the problem of housing buildings is that they are an endless repetition of a unit or two or three types of units. And this repetition needs to be addressed in a, a specific way that is different from all other architectural types. It poses a complexity, again, that requires uh, a little bit more of imagination from the architects and a, a complete understanding of um, what are the, the constraints and also the possibilities. So we will start with the ground floor interface. Um, the ground floor is a connector or let's say establishes a link or what we call threshold. It's important that you start getting used to this word because, it, I mean, I can translate it in many different ways, but in reality, what we mean by a floor that makes the link between private and public, between uh, urban space and building, both at a horizontal and a vertical level, is called a threshold. So what this means is, the, thresh, the ground floor is, may, marks the threshold between what is the public space and the private space of the building, between the public open space and the private space of the building. It separates different types of activities. It separates different types of people, meaning residents from non-residents. It separates from people and so on and so forth. And it does that at an horizontal level and at a vertical level. So we will address this issue of the ground floor by uh, 
looking into different parameters. And the first parameter is what we call entrances and transitions. That is the bigger scale. How do we access the building? What is the relationship of the building uh, with its surrounding urban structures? How does the ground floor mediate between the public urban space and the private space of the building? And I have divided it between four different um, stages, let's put it like that. The stage A is approaching the building, so it's how the ground floor mediates between the urban space and the, the semi-private or private space of the plot that the building occupies. Then B is how to demark the entrance of the building. So we are not talking about the plot anymore, but rather how do the door that makes the marks the entrance to the building. Then C, the entrance of the apartment, because a housing building is not a house. So there is an entrance to the building, and then there is the entrance to your apartment. And then last is the stepping out of an apartment meaning how does the apartment or the dwelling unit relate to the outside and in within a private realm that is the private realm of the dwelling so going to point a that is approaching the building there are different ways that this approach can be done so in the first case, we are talking about when the public access, meaning the public space, ends in the building plot. So this is Rue de Suisse in Paris. I use the same graphics through all the slides, so you will always see this kind of uh, cold code and um, uh, icons to represent what I call public, semi-private, private, private parking, and semi-private green area to kind of help you navigate to this idea because, as I said, the ground floor interface is all about marking the threshold or mediating between the public realm and the private realm. So you will always see this color code to, to kind of understand how horizontally and vertical this um, mediation takes place. So in question one, is the public access ends at the building. What does it mean? In, for example, the example of Rue de Suisse, the, the building occupies um, an inner plot, so it's, it's an infill, or what you've learned uh, in the previous lecture, uh, urban infill. So uh, in gray, we have other uh, buildings, and then the, this building by Herzog and de Moron occupy, closes the block, on top and on the left side and that occupies also the center of uh, the plot and there are only two accesses to the building that is on the left side and on the top of the block and there is a gate so what happens is once you pass through this gate you are in a semi-private place. You are not in a private area because this area belongs to all residents and if the doors are open, people can pass through. But as you can imagine, there is also a psychological factor to it. That is, if you are walking along a street and you see a gate, you, you know that maybe you are not supposed to enter there, even if it is open. So it's what we call a semi-private place. And it ends at let's say the limit between the street and the plot and here are some images of how this looks like so because the, uh, the public space ends at the address of the plot um, you can see it here uh, on the left side right uh, this is the facade of the main street so there is like a gate and this is seen from the interior so the gate, the gate can be open but it, it's a gate and this allows the inner part to be much more open to the outside so in this apartment facing the street here you have shops or the garage so the apartment only developed from the uh, first floor up because 
there is a very close connection to the street, so little privacy, while in the inner courtyard, as you can see in the images, the apartments start from the ground because it's a much more private area of the building. And even if neighbors can go there, the reality is it has much less people and a much more sense of privacy, even if it's a space shared by all the neighbors. Then the second option is when the public access penetrates the building. So in this case, the Sargfa brick in Vienna, we have a building that is very similar to Rue de Suisse. So we have an infill of um, a block, a residential block in the center of Vienna, and the building is going to infill the remaining open voids of the block, and then it's going to develop to the inner part of the block. In this case, there is no gate, so the people are able to cross. For, for example, if they want to cut uh, their journey, they can go through the inner side of the plot and get out on the other side. And the way the architect did that, um, and okay, why is it public? Because he places many functions on uh, this interior part, like a seminar hall, a restaurant, a cultural hall, so a kindergarten. So what happens is, for example, if I live in this neighborhood, like in this building, and I want to go to the restaurant, I will have to enter this area to go to the restaurant. So it becomes public space. What happens uh, when we have a public space? We have to be more careful in controlling this, uh, the views of the apartment. I I'm not going to go to many details here, but see this line over here that I marked as uh, semi-private. I, I marked this line for you to understand what are the problems of having a public street next to our lots. These flats are single-oriented units that only face in this direction, that it's an open direction. It's, there is no wall here, the building is elevated. And the same happens in the units on the top and the units on the right, they are facing the inner, uh, an inner garden. So what happens when we have a, pub, a very public street, unlike the previous example, to make sure that if we have units at the ground level, they have the necessary amount of privacy required for a unit because you don't want or you can't have windows facing a public street. I mean, you can, but then you might have a serious problem of um, public exposure. So it's possible for this unit to have uh, facing the street windows for ventilation and maybe light, but not necessarily views. And this is how the building looks like. So this is a pedestrian street where you can easily access and you can see the more glazed areas are the areas of the restaurants and the kindergarten. There is also in the center of the plot, the pool. So I mean, the pedestrian street that is marked in blue uh, doesn't, um, um, interfere with the private or the semi-private space of the neighbors, like for example the pool. The pool has an independent access, so if I live here I can go to the pool, while the people that are crossing the streets every day don't access it. So you have to, when you have the public space penetrating the building, you have to make sure first of all that the flats located on the ground floor have enough privacy, but also that the access to the facilities of the building are also controlled. Many times we use students think that it's good to allow everyone to access the facilities of the building. You have to be very careful and think about what type of rents are you targeting? Because of course a restaurant has to be accessed by the biggest amount of people, not just the residents. The residents of a complex are not never going to be able to bring enough profit to a, a, a retail units such as a restaurant. But when we are talking about facilities like um, public common areas, gardens, pools, gyms, we always have to think, you know, what is the size of this facility and is it enough for the residents or is it, is it si the size is, is enough for the amount of residents or is it made for 
more people and we wish to have foreign people accessing those facilities because then that leads to an issue of control and security that uh, we have to consider uh, when promoting or not that public access. The third example is when um, the public access simultaneously penetrates the building and not. So for example, this is the Piraeus residential building that is an urban block and it has two scenarios. So the block has this awkward shape because there was a house. Uh, I'm not sure it was a house. I think it was a customs house that was located in this area. And so the architect wanted to keep the house, keep this building, and so he basically moved the block around this element. And so what happens to the block is that basically it's one big block that was then transformed into almost two, but they are connected on the top part. So instead of having one big central courtyard, you have two. These courtyards, one of them, the one on the left, is visible from the outside, but it has gates. So it's a semi-private green area. The second one is only visible by residents. It can be accessed from the street, directly from the street, but again, it, it has a gate. It's a semi-private place only for the residents. And then we have the central access that is public and anyone can cross. So there you have a combination of um, of the public space penetrating the building and the at the building. The difference is, for example, in the public area, you have retail units. So in this area over here in the center, you have retail units, you have office spaces that people can rent. Uh, so it's, it has a more public nature. And while in the areas that where it, it was blocked, you already have residential units because the level of privacy is higher and basically the garden is directly accessed by the units that are on the ground level, but it can also be accessed from the other residents, but this, this access is, is quite tricky. So the, the dwelling was really made, this green space, sorry, was really made to be accessed mainly for the units that stand on the ground. Not that the others are not possible, but as you can see here, there are very limited accesses to the central space, and it was made on purpose to enhance the privacy of the residents on the ground level. And here are some images. So um, this is the shape of the block. So as you can see, it's one block, but then on the ground level is divided into two. Um, on the left, you have the pedestrian view. So you have flats already on the ground level, but they are slightly elevated. So you have to go up steps to enter through the door. This is a very, very simple way on the left to create privacy in ground floor units. That is, you elevate around five meters, that is around uh, five or six set steps, and that is enough for the window to be higher than the, the standard uh, v, uh, eye level of a standard high person. Then facing the garden or a, an open area, you have a much bigger opening that is from uh, the bigger courtyard, but it is gated. And then this uh, on the right side, you see the public passage that people can uh, cross. So the public space penetrates the building. And then you see on five and six, the shopping units that are on, on located on uh, office spaces and retail units that are located on this area. And on seven you have, uh, because it's a more public area on the five, six and seven are facing the sea. And so it has a pedestrian walkway, it has shops, cafes, offices. So it's a more uh, live place of the building. Um, Another option, or the final option, is when you have a three-dimensional public access to the building. This is not very common, or it wasn't very common, but it has become more and more common in, in dense urban areas in contemporary times. It's when the public space ends at the building, but there is a three-dimensional semi-private space 
that is used by all neighbors. So instead of being all on the ground, it's almost like the ground kind of goes vertical. And I'm going to try to explain you to the images. So this is the, the commissaries in uh, Venlo, uh, Netherlands. So this is a, a typical block, perimeter block uh, building. So this is a dense urban area and the building uh, is defined by the limit of the plot, so it's what we call a perimeter block. And from uh, one side, uh, you have from two sides, you have a public street, and the building includes um, on the area of where number three is, it includes a kind of um, business center. So you have some shops, and you have an entrance and basically a bunch of storage spaces and office spaces uh, that go up, I think, to three or four floors. And then facing the main street, you have a supermarket. Number one is like a park. So this area is facing like a big open space. And then where number two is, you have the entrance of your building. And this area now is very much related to the building. So you have the administration offices of the building and you have the, the main entrance of the building. And then from the back, you have the entrance of the cops. But then what happens is, as you can see in the section, so in red, we, you have the private space of this business center and some uh, uh, areas of uh, facilities of the building like um, a communal hall and uh, some storage areas. And as you can see on the left, from the lift, that is the central element in the middle of the building, there is a kind of a staircase or an amphitheater kind that connects all the different levels of the building. So what happens is the ground floor extruded vertically. And you can see here in some of the images, that means that from any floor, we have a gallery access with single oriented units. So from every floor, the residents can come out and have access to the common space of the building, which is a semi-private space. That is a very interesting solution where you want neighbors to engage from every floor. So you don't have to catch the elevator and go down. You can immediately access this public space, but that goes from the ground to the last floor of the building. It's a very interesting. It's a very interesting approach to design, but obviously can only work where, for example, where you have a gallery access, single-oriented units. It could it could be done with central lift access, but let's say it would not work as well because if there was no lift in the center, but rather a central lift access for every two units, then again people would come out of the elevator and go direct to their flats. When you have a situation like this, the ideal is I will have an elevator and when I come out of the elevator, I see the public space and so I tend to engage more directly with it. So there is no point on making all this effort of creating this big three-dimensional public, public space. No, sorry, semi-public space because it belongs only to the neighbors. It has a gate that you can see here on image number two. It's a gate area that has a, that is closed. Um, you cannot have such a, there is no point on having such a big three-dimensional space if you are not going, to, and that goes to every floor, if you are not going to try to engage the residents with it uh, in a day-to-day -day basis. Um, then these are the four types that we can have in terms of approaching the building. Now we are going to go to the entrance of the building. So the door of the building, not of the dwelling unit of the apartment, but of the building. In resume, what we have to think is, unlike a house, maybe like a house, but I think it's unlike a house because the entrance of an apartment building is not the entrance of one apartment building, it's the entrance of a bunch of apartment buildings. So a building can have 51,000 residential units inside and so the entrance is very important that it's properly marked that marked that has the size and the proportion related to the public space in front of it so like i was showing you in the pirayos building and i i choose the same building so that you could understand you have different types of entrances to the building so this the number one is the one that faces a big park so 
it's a very large um, entrance that allows a connection between the semi-public garden and the private and the public uh, garden then you have the entrances that face the main street you have two types you have one uh, the number two and number three that are high and recessed and have a, a scale that it's not as big as the one facing the garden because it's not necessary it's it's a street but it's big enough for us as we walk the street to understand uh, that the, the entrance is there and then in four and five you have the entrances of um, to the building much smaller and why because it's it's an inner part of the building it's the inner part of the courtyard so you don't need to highlight as much the entrances of the building they, because they are in a secondary area so you know they are more um, humble let's put it this way so what is important in terms of the entering of the building first of all the identity you have to create a door that gives that conveys the status of the building and that relates in terms of proportion and scale to the public space that it serves and it also you have to think that it always mediates different uses so for example it might mediate commercial residential services with the residential units so you have to think about you know for example how do you if you have just a residential area uh, maybe this door just has to have the proper scale but it doesn't have to stand out too much if you have re retail units then you have to like you see in number four it's very important to recess the door because there are passers by on the street looking at the windows of the shop so you need to create a certain seclusion so you have to always think what are the uses that are being mediated and what would be um, the proper scale of the entrance and the proper location also you always have to think that a door uh, or the entrance of an apartment uh, building a uh, housing building has to include you know all the doorbells all the mailboxes unless you put them inside which is another issue so there has to be a certain size so that people can actually stop ring their the flat that they are going to expect for an answer for them to open the door and so on and so forth um, also then once we pass this door so let's assume that you did the door properly then once you pass the door another very important thing is what has to exist on this ground level many times students don't seem to understand if I am going to a residential building, I will have, like I said, this door, and this door has to allow me to ring a bell or check my mailbox without being bothered by the passersby on the street. The relationship with the public space has to is very important. Or, but then I have to enter the building into a hall an entrance hall that is the entrance hall of the building and the entrance hall of the building first of all has to have a proper proportion to the size of the building and has to mediate many different functions so for example this is the Gemini residences in Amsterdam so here you can see the size of the hall that connects all the different four floors and in this case the entrances have to include the storage spaces in this case it has the storage spaces for the bicycles uh, other sp storage areas technical areas uh, the mailboxes because in this case the mailboxes are not facing inside this is a decision that uh, you have to to make if you want the mailman to enter your hall or not that's how we decide if we want the mailboxes to be facing the street or not so it has to include uh, a place for the security man a little space for him for the security cameras all the technical areas for garbage electricity ac and so on uh, storage spaces and it has to allow you to mediate between this public and private space so for example 
I have the main entrances. That is what residents might use if they are going to the public space, but mainly for visitors. But then, for example, if I enter from here with my bike, then I'm going to get out from the inside area. I'm not going to get out of the building and then go around to enter through the main door. I put this example, maybe I should add another car parking, but I think the, the bicycles is, is perfectly understandable. The same applies to cars. In this case, in the Gemini residences, the parking is outside. So you enter the parking and then you have to go out and walk and enter the main door. But if I am a resident, I will enter through here with my bicycle from the public space and then I would get out through this area already inside the building, go to my flat. I'm not going to get out of the building again and then enter. It's very important that you understand that because many times students don't understand this difference between visitors and residents and how do I park my car or park my bicycle and then go to the public space. One of the mistakes that students do very often is to allow everyone to enter the parking spaces. And I always ask them, okay, so if you allow everyone to enter your parking area, like any visitor, first of all, how do you control that the number of spaces available? So, for example, a building is calculated to have a certain number of parking spaces. If anyone can come in, then how do you ensure that you always have your space? This is point one. Point two is, if anyone can enter the building and then immediately access the inner part of the building, how can you assure the proper level of security within your building. Imagine you you going, arriving late at night, coming from a friend's house or a family member, and then you are going through to your lift to go to your floor, and then some stranger is waiting for you and attacks you or robs you. That that cannot be. You have to have a certain level of security, and that's what this mediation does. So normally visitors park outside and they have to ring the bell. Um, residents park inside or in or underground or above ground and then they access directly the inner part of the building. They don't have to go out because if they have to go out, first of all, there is a problem of security, but also there is a problem of functionality. Imagining that, imagine that I'm carrying the groceries from the supermarket. It's a big hazard if I have to go out with my, all my groceries and in, for example. Then when um, when talking about the third aspect, uh, that is entering the private living space. So we talked about approaching the building and entering the, the residential building. Now we are going to talk about the relationship between the private space, that is your apartment, and um, the exterior space. And now this mediation or threshold takes place. First, we will talk about horizontal thresholds. Traditionally, and I think y you, you will understand this issue. For example, in your houses, there is a front garden and a, bank, a, a back garden. That is a typical horizontal threshold. They are made to create a distance from your house and your windows to the other houses, okay? Then, normally in Bahraini houses, there is another element that is a wall. That is an architectural element that complements the horizontal threshold. But it is an horizontal threshold, meaning the separation between your windows or your private space and the street, the public space, is an horizontal distance. Okay? Now, I give you here an example that is different from a house because we are talking about um, residential buildings, just to give you an idea of how these horizontal thresholds can work. This is um, the nonprofit apartments, um, Sesta Goris. Um, how do, they are like uh, low-rise apartment buildings and they are in a very suburban area so as you can see in the plan the parking is uh, alongside the buildings and then you have this s kind of or two in this case it makes a number two shaped buildings that kind of create this 
um, inner courtyards that are of a public access, but because they are recessed, it creates almost a kind of a semi-private feeling, meaning this is what I meant by uh, the psychology of it. If you have a, a, a group of buildings that that is kind of recess, people that are passing by always have this impression that it's a semi-private space, even if it doesn't have a gate. Of course, anyone can enter, but psychologically, it gives you the impression that it is a semi-private space. And so what happens in this case is they have a combination of an horizontal threshold with a slight, a slight vertical threshold. And I will explain why. That's what I explained to you before in the Pirayos building. As you can see here in the section, there is a difference, a slight difference of height. What does this do? This allows the gallery accesses that are here to be slightly separated from the public gardens that are the central courtyards over here. So it allows you to uh, to have a, a more sense of um, noise reduction, but also a higher sense of privacy because of this um, slight um, uh, depression because the height of a person then it's not uh, the high height of a person is below the the placement of the window so it allows to you to have um, a higher level of privacy and you can see here on this section how these windows are located towards this um, public space but as you can see on the other courtyard it's at the same level because you have gallery access here. The units are facing the park that is slightly depressed. So you have an horizontal threshold that is this garden creates a distance. And because of its form, meaning this recess towards the, the, the public parking, it gives people the sense that it is only made for the residents. So the residents will just, um, th th this, this park creates a distance. It's not a place where you you play and run a lot. It's more a place for access to the houses. It, probably a place to play will be the larger courtyard that is depressed or the other areas. And as you can see from the private dwellings, you have an horizontal threshold that leads you to the entrances. But then from the other sides where the units are facing, you will have a vertical threshold that I will talk about it on uh, the other slides. The problem of this threshold is that it's very subtle. So it works uh, the, if you are in a, a society that it's culturally respectful, meaning they understand the psychology of that I'm talking about. So they don't tend to invade the semi-private spaces. If you are in a societies where security is a problem or where people don't understand this concept, of this boundaries of private, public and semi-public, then it, they might not work because you might have people just going through these areas like we see here on this image and trying to look inside the windows and you, you don't want that. Then the other example is like I was uh, telling you about uh, your houses or many Barini houses. That is when we have a fence, an edge or a wall. I brought here an example of the Villain Court in Paris because I, I think it's interesting how, because I, I personally think that the wall is a very harsh barrier. It's it's a barrier that really disconnects the public space from the private space. And I guess you have all experienced what it is to walk around an area full of houses that are walled. It, it's a very harsh environment because you are walking and you just see the entrances to, to, the, to the houses and there is no activity taking place. There is no life on it. You, you, you cannot interact. There is no interaction within the public space. So this example, I think it's a very interesting one. So it's an apartment building, it's not a house. And there are flats on the ground level. So in blue, we have the main street. And then you have different buildings that share a common um, green space. This green space is buried, uh, bar has a barrier, sorry. Um, so there are gates, as you can see in the images, that prevent uh, 
people from the outside to access and it gives you access to a garden that is shared by all the buildings because this is in a residential area uh, they they didn't want it to have facilities or commercial spaces in in the building so they have flats going from the ground level starting from the ground level and what they did is they created this kind of as you can see here on the pan this green fences that allow the apartments on the ground level to have a sense of privacy as you can see on the image but it's also part of the facade of the garden which is a very cool feature so if you are in your terrace you will have this vision of a green vertical green fence and if you are on the garden side you also feel like it integrates with you so it's a kind it's a, a, a physical uh, division between public and private but that blurs with the surrounding environment creating a nicer experience spatial experience then other horizontal threshold is the loggia or what we call the arcades in this case or in the use of other natural elements so for example uh, in this case, that is the Nuovo Portobello in Milan, the buildings, the, as you can see, the building area, so it has a, an horizontal threshold that is a wall. But in the area that faces the main street, as you can see in the image, because uh, it's the main uh, street, this part of the building, and you can see here in the section, it has um, the main entrances, to the to this building but also some commercial spaces so there is a distancing between the the street and the, the semi-private or semi-public place of the building that is an arcade so people that are walking along this arcade they know that they are already in the area of the building they know that they are in a semi-public space so they can still walk but they know that this area belongs to the building at the at the same time loggias allow you to understand this demarcation but also to shade the public space which sometimes for example in climates like Bahrain uh, it, it's a plus another way to create an horizontal threshold is like the silo dam in amsterdam that is a, an horizontal separation by a natural element that is water in the silo dam you can only access the silo dam when the architect tells you that you can access for example you have the staircases and and bridges that connect you to the flats on the ground level and then you have the main entrance that is also like a bridge that connects you to the entrance of the building so using natural elements like water really demarcates it's an horizontal threshold but it, it's impenetrable unlike the green areas the green areas are penetrable uh, thresholds so you f you know that you shouldn't be going there but you can the water you cannot or a vertical fence i mean you can jump on it but you, you supposedly you cannot then there are vertical thresholds i already kind of explained you in the previous example um but uh, because we are walking Vertical thresholds is where you want to separate the residential activities um, from the, the public activities of the street vertically. This way, you, ha you are assured that there is a certain amount of privacy to the residential units. Like you, we said, for example, in houses, normally the threshold is horizontal through an architectural element that is the wall. But in residential buildings, if you want to have um, flats on the ground floor, an horizontal threshold, like the examples I showed you, might not be enough. It depends on the elements that you are going to use. But even if you create a physical distancing, you might not have a visual distancing, meaning maybe people can still look inside your buildings. And so you always have to understand that thresholds in terms of the dwelling, the relationship between the dwelling unit and the public space always have to cover these two parameters. One is a matter of security, meaning can I access the dwelling? 
uh, through the outdoor windows and, and doors. Two is a matter of visual privacy. That is, can I look inside? So vertical thresholds are normally used when we need to ensure a certain level of privacy, visual privacy, to the dwelling units. Of course, that they always also give you security because they are distancing themselves from the street vertically. So the simple way of doing a vertical threshold is by slightly elevating the building. So in this case, in uh, Ilsburg, in Amsterdam, this Isleburg is a very large residential uh, complex of, uh, built by many different architects. So, for example, in this case, you have a building that is composed of a uh, the the several floors have the parking uh, units and and some flats, the parking spaces and some flats, and then you have this horizontal distribution of uh, terrace houses. So, as you can see, there is uh, in the back facade, the front facade has is this one street that says street facade so there is this steps that take you to the inner part of the take you to each dwelling unit that is recessed so this is all meant to give you to increase the privacy and demarcate public space from uh, private space and then on the back the same there is an elevation between the garden and the, the residential units to create a distancing, a vertical distancing, so that you cannot look so much into the private room. In this case, because it's Amsterdam, the, this is much more of a um, psychological separation than a visual one, because a Dutch society is uh, is used to have houses that are very exposed to the outs outside. In other societies, if you wanted to have residential units on the ground floor, then you would have to have smaller windows on the ground level. Smaller, no, normal windows, not top to bottom doors and windows. Normal windows with um, a parapet of uh, 90 centimeters or one meter to make sure that people cannot see the inside. Then. There are vertical thresholds that are composed of one or several floors. And that's when we really want to make sure that all the residential units are at the proper uh, separation between the public space and the private space. So, for example, uh, in the Zellstrasse uh, 5 in Berlin or in the Parkrand in Amsterdam, what happens is we have two different situations, but they have the same purpose. In the, in the Zellstrasse, what happens is, as you can see here in this section, you have two types of units. You have the units that are on the back of the plot and the units that are facing the main street. You elevate, you move all the building up, so and then you put the parking on the ground level. But in the case of the Zellstrasse, the units, the residential units that are facing the street are composed by triplex flats. And these triplex flats on the ground level have an office space. So these units were made for those people that work at home and want to have an office space connected to the street. So what happens is on the ground there is an office space and then on the upper two floors you have the residential units. That means that is that there is vertical between the residential spaces and the public street. Then in the units on the back, what happens is by elevating the public space, by uh, elevating the flats, you create an inner garden that is private for neighbors and that it's only access from the different dwelling units, like you can see here on the images. Now, there is a certain level of permeability as we can imagine, so, for example, the neighbors of the two blocks or people walking within this public space can look inside the houses, but it's a, a limited exposure or an, a t to, 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 the, to, to your neighbors, let's put it like that. In the park ground, that is done in a much more separated manner. So the parkings on the ground level is what we call half floor. So it goes half floor down and half floor up this way. All the residential units are half a floor, 1.5 meters above the street level and the park level, and that allows them to have the necessary levels of privacy. On this area over here, that is the units that are located on the 
the first floor, let's put it this way, you only have accesses to the buildings. All these units are single oriented. That means that that is this plan over here. You only have the access to the units. On the above level, so let's say the second, you have a park or um, a suspended plaza like you can see here on the images. This area is public, but you don't have windows of the units facing this area, only the entrances to the buildings. Therefore, you ensure that there is no uh, sp private spaces of the houses facing the public space of the building. And that is, uh, that is an important uh, consideration. Then we are going uh, to talk about um, how is the relationship between the apartment building and the outside. So um, until now, we are talking about how do we enter the public space. So what there are horizontal thresholds and vertical thresholds that kind of create this separation between the public street and the entrance of your flat and how can you create have the proper the proper levels of privacy with inside it but then there is another aspect that is what we call the relationship between our windows and the outside i'm already kind of talking about it but it's a different uh, as, as we move along, because of course all these uh, topics are connected to each other, but it's a different aspect. That is, how do you make a balcony or, or a window to ensure that you have security and privacy? What you have um, to take into consideration is that when you create a relationship between your window or door of your apartment to the outside when you want to create an outdoor space for your dwelling unit you have to ensure that it is clear so for example in the Arlamir housing project is a project um, by Erzberger that was meant to enhance community life so the buildings literally face, or many of the buildings literally face the public uh, space. That is the space marked in blue in the middle of the residential plot. And as you can see in the section, the space was made to kind of alternate between the, the flats that are going to be overlooking the street and the flats that are not. So the, the flats that are facing the main street, you only have the entrances to the buildings and then the balconies are facing the outside to ensure that they are not overlooking other buildings. While the, the flats that are on the inner side of the plot, the windows have to, the main windows or the, the majority of the windows have to be facing this public space. So what the architect did is, they, we call it um, uh, back to back, that is, the, the, the main windows of your flat are never overlooking the main windows of the other flat. This allows you to not have that situation where you open your window and you are immediately seeing your neighbor. But even in this case, if you notice the way the balconies are made, they create the suspended of the staircases, create this kind of space in between. This is the space that at the ground level, the residents use as an extension where they can sit and talk to their neighbors or they can have a dinner or a lunch outside if the weather is nice. So it's very exposed to the street, but it's clearly demarked as their property, as their unit. It's not, this is what I mean about psychology, it's an horizontal threshold that marks the space of the unit, not the public space. As you can see here in the image, even the cars are parked, but there is a clear demarcation of what is the street, what is the place of the, the car, and then what is this ground floor place that is belongs to the unit. And then on the upper floors, you have balconies that are quite big that allow people to have this extension of the, the private space into the outdoor without being too exposed because the other flats on the opposite side don't have windows to that side. Another way uh, is what I call the combination of horizontal and uh, vertical thresholds. So, for example, the Egean 
it edgy and one dang and in Zurich it's very difficult to say the name of some projects um, has um, what we call um, the semi-raised floor so similar to the park run that I showed you previously this is an elevated platform so you go half a floor down and half a floor up you go half a floor down and you have your parking spaces and from your parking space you can immediately access the whole the vertical the course of the buildings to go up to your flat okay but then connected to the street, you also have a raised platform that is 1.5 meters up. That is a public space where all the neighbors can go down, meet, the children can play, and so on. If you look at the flats, I mark them. The entrances, uh, the orange represent the entrance holes of each building, the entrance of the building. And if you notice the way they are located, they always face the main public space or semi-public space, while the flats are always oriented towards the landscape. Because the building is elevated, there you can have apartment units over already from the ground floor up because people that are on the surrounding landscape cannot see the interior of the buildings because they are 1.5 meter elevated from the surrounding area. And so, as you can see in the images, it allows you to have apartments from immediately from the ground floor without having your privacy, um, um, let's say, disturbed. And then all the, bu the buildings, some buildings have balconies, uh, some apartments have balconies, others don't. But if you notice, even in the sections, the balconies are always facing the outside. So, you know, if you live in this flat, when you go down to the platform, you can play and have all sorts of activities. They have playgrounds and sports fields and so on. But then when you reach your unit, you have an open, the relationship of your flat with the outdoor is through this balcony space that has enough privacy for you to be able to go outside and not feel that you are too exposed. Some notes. Uh, well, to finalize this issue of the ground level, it's very important to separate functions. So the ground floor is normal predestined to house public uses, such as stores, studios, common spaces, and sites of informal encounters. Um, it can host residential level if you are talking about um, terrace houses, like you see on the last image. But when you have apartments located on the ground you have to be very careful because this ground floor also has to jiggle many different aspects like the emergency access roads the public passageways meaning the access to and from the building and relationship to the street entries to uh, entries to underground parking garages the location of trash disposal the storage of bicycle and other areas other parking spaces so even when you have terrace houses like in this project in Amsterdam see this is all the same project and as you can see in the first image this is how the building relates to the public street or the main street so you have residential spaces in the bottom and uh, commercial spaces in the bottom and residentials on the top so it's a vertical threshold and then in the other facades that are secondary street areas, you have a combination of inner courtyards that are semi-private and then parking garages on the ground. So you have horizontal and vertical thresholds. And then in some areas that have very little movement, you have um, just the small little gardens that make you a uh, horizontal threshold because these are trip -clux units that have office spaces on the ground. So you have an horizontal threshold, but then you also have a spatial organization that allows you uh, to have a house that is directly connected to the street. Um, what is important in terms of the separation of the function is that you allow all these aspects to coexist in a nicely designed manner. So you have to make sure that your ground floor has a powerful idea for the space to integrate all these functions together. And you have to make sure that you assign functions to specific areas on the ground floor, but in a flexible manner. So you have to make sure that you know where the parking takes space, where the services takes 
take place, where communal areas take place. So, but you also have to have a certain level of flexibility, especially when designing uh, communal or gathering areas. For example, this is the answer of Yertel and Berlin. The building is slightly raised and it has to connect the street on the front with a park on the back. In the meantime, they have to have access areas and because it's a big urban block that it's like two blocks merged together, the architect also wanted to make sure that the two blocks are one unit. So you have the entrance of the parking to number two and then you have pedestrian access to at the ground level that takes you directly to the cores of the building that are marked in red and then you also have and to storage areas that are on the ground level like you can see here but then you also have an elevated platform that is a plateau that is a communal area like you can see in image four that connects the two buildings together and allows residents a covered space for them to meet when the weather is not very nice but it also unifies the two towers that connecting the two cores and to the park on the back so it's a you it, the, this building is able to separate all these different functions but at the same time in a un a monic way unifying everything together and that's what the ground floor has to do to allow this different hierarchy of privacy levels but in a, a, a cohesive manner in this building, I can access to the parking, I can access to all the services that are on this uh, ground area. I can easily reach the plateau, as you can see from image one or two, you know, you can see that there is a public area there. Then from there, you can reach your central course and go to the park, go to the street in a very easy manner and harmonic way. You also have to ensure that the ground floor allows for spaces of social coexistence from these different projects and these are the projects that i've shown you before the ground floor has to also be a place that allows for the, a certain level of privacy or the required level of privacy but also ensures that people gather and meet there is nothing worse in a residential project than accentuated individuality individuality or, or very private spaces don't give you a sense of belonging and this is a connection with your neighbors and for you to feel at home you also have to feel that you are part of a community and it is the spaces of social coexistence these thresholds that are in between the entrances of buildings that allow for uh, a community to grow it's the place where the children go and play, where you go and take a break and catch some fresh air. You go to exercise. Uh, retired people can meet other people and not feel so alone. So it's a very important space in the building. And it's very important that you understand how to combine this vertical and horizontal thresholds to create a pleasant urban environment. Because, as I try to explain to you, there are thresholds that accentuate privacy and separation and others that accentuate integration. And so we have to choose our thresholds depending on what is the goals that we want to achieve in our design. And this is for um, grant for interface. Now we are going to go to the facade composition. In residential architecture, the facade is often the only thing perceived as the product of architecture, the life of the inhabitants. Unlike other parts of the residential building, the facade can be regarded separately. It is seen as a whole, while the residential building is composed of many, many, many individual parts. But it's still a reflection. So. It's the only part of the residential building that is actually seen as a building and it reflects the statues of, of those people and that building. So it's very important, um, especially when we are talking about affordable housing, but for any type of residential building, uh, to think about how the facade is going to, on one hand, respond to the inner organization of the building because there are thousands of windows that need to be placed to bring light and ventilation to the individual apartments but also to uh, 
determine um, the status of the building and the functions that the status uh, yeah of the building and the, the functions that it needs for, to fulfill. It is very common for students to design residential buildings as if they were office buildings with a curtain wall, without ever thinking of this needs that I was talking to you before about, for example, this relationship between the private dwelling and the outdoor. Uh, when we are working uh, in an office space, we tend to have a less need to connect to the outside world. But in our homes, like I said, everyone had a backyard and a front yard before. So to think of a house today as an enclosed hermetic enclosure, it might be very claustrophobic for people. And it also might look like not a home. And so we have to always think that it is the facade that it's going to create this um, mediation and, and to kind of uh, share the image of a home, of what people would consider a home. So the relationship between inside and out, I discard by the open scene, the facade that are doors and windows, basically doors mediates the immediate experience. So it allows it to go in and out while a window is not so much as a physical mediator, but rather a visual mediator. The window allows you to look outside. So it's very important that you think, what are you seeing on the outside? Um, I've been talking about it, like, do I open the window and I see the window of my neighbor? Do I see a nice view? Do I see an ugly view? This is what the window does. Okay, um, the windows and doors, they conceal or open, okay? So the design of a facade expresses how the individuals relate to the outside world. Before the Industrial Revolution, uh, buildings and the facade of the buildings were defined by their structure. So the structure of the building, that's why we have very repetitive windows alongside, you know, uh, along a building and uh, because and the, the windows have a certain size and a certain dimension that have to do with the structural constraints at the time. But that all changed in the 20th century. And nowadays you can have houses like the case study house number 22 by Pierre Koning that can be completely exposed to the outside. But even if technology allows us to do that, we always have to think, you know, about this physical mediation that the door does and the visual mediation that the window does, meaning where am I looking at and do I have enough privacy inside my house? In residential architecture, um, normally urban developments need tend to be close to each other. So unlike the case study number 22, where you have an open view and so the you can have a completely glazed facade. In most residential uh, developments, you have to concern yourself not only with other buildings that might be facing your building, but also with the quality of the views. And so it's very important the way you think about the facade to kind of create an, a nice and good positive mediation between in and out. It's what we call the building shell. That is what the facade does. It shells the side and creates opportunities for the best possible solutions between the mediation in between inside and outside. So the dressing of a facade is above all a sensory experience. Material, color, visual effect and haptic qualities all play out to please the eye. There are different ways of dressing the facade, and I'm going to go through one by one. The first one, or the first type of dressing, is what we call dressing the interior. Dressing the interior is about creating a, a, like a dress. It's like the same way that you cover yourself with clothes. they meant to protect, it, protect you from the cold, uh, the, the weather, the climate, uh, and other people. 
to protect your own privacy, right? The same you can do with a building. You can dress a building to kind of control this mediation between in and out. So you can dress with vegetation. This is an extreme example, but I'll, I, I put it here because I, thought, I think it's very interesting, is the residential tower flower. And literally, you have these huge pots that are around the entire building. Not only they bring a sense of freshness and greenery to all the flats, but as you can see from the view from the inside, it completely alters the view of the building. So when you are in this building, you are always seeing greenery, not necessarily the other buildings, because that's what the architect wanted to achieve. Then you can dress with fixed elements. This is Casa de la Marina. Uh, by Antonio Cordec, and it's a, in Barcelona in a very dense residential area. So what he did is created uh, these uh, shutters that slide and completely cover the building. So you still have natural light and ventilation because the shutters, you know, let natural light pass. But if the residents want, they will be in a completely enclosed environment, completely protected from the outside. As you know, in Barcelona, the light is already, it's a Mediterranean climate, so the light, the sunlight is already very intense. So it is important to protect buildings and windows uh, from the sunlight in the summer to cool down the houses, but in this case also from the views. Then you have the opportunity to dress in layers. This is by the Vertex Apartment Building by Carlos Ferrater, and as you can see on the plans, the facade kind of moves similar to Cordec, but it moves to create these recessed balconies. And what it does is, as you can see here in the image, you have two sets of sliding partitions, the ones that are aligned with the facade and then ones that are aligned with the limit of the building that is angular to the inside. So the residents can choose, because it has two layers, like a front one and a back one, if they slide these units, align with each other, you will not see any windows. And then if they slide them out, then you can see some windows. So it allows you to control level of privacy, not only inside your apartment, but also in the balcony space. It allows you to choose how are you going to protect yourself from the views and from the sun. Then you can dress with a protective screen. So unlike Ferrater, that those buildings are located in Spain, in the south of Spain, so there is this need to protect your privacy, but also to protect yourself from the power of the sun. In the Egut, in um, Erbel, the problem is different. That is, we are talking about a Central European country where light is necessary, but privacy is also necessary. So instead of dressing with fixed elements, they are dressing with these light screens that allow light to go in, but ensure your privacy. And the slide screens are placed in front of the balcony. So as you can see in the views from the inside, you have your flat and then you have a balcony that is protected by the screens of light. People can still use the outdoor space and, and have a feeling of the outdoor, but be protected from the, the outside eye let's put it uh, like that, but still have the heating of the natural light, which is important. Then you can dress the interior with a mask. What does this mean? Okay, um, it's when, and this happens very commonly in residential projects, when you have the rows of different sizes and shapes that you need to unify. Normally, residential buildings can look very ugly if you are not careful in the size and location and placement of the windows. In this case, the Flats Residential Complex in Philadelphia, what they did is, as you can see here on the axonometric view, the, the flat has many different types of windows and balconies. And so what the architect decided to do is to create a uniform facade that is literally attached to the building to give a uniform look to the building. So when you look at it, it looks like a composition that is harmonious, but in the back, there are different things happening. So sometimes this 
openings give uh, access to balconies that don't have exactly the same size as the opening to windows and so on. So this is what we call a mask. So it is an element that is going to give uniformity, uniformity to an unorganized facade. Another way of uh, looking at the facade is to relate them to the context. So before we were talking about dressing the facade, so you are going to basically dress it as with clothing to kind of give it a uniform look. But you might not want to do that. You might want to design your facade in relationship to the surrounding. And this takes me to the concept of anamorphosis, that is the process of creating coherent images or perspectives depending on the viewer's standpoint. A building doesn't have to be one thing. We move through the building. So if you move through the buildings, the facade can also adapt to different situations and different contexts. When I look at the building from one side, I don't have to guess what happens on the back side. The, fa the facade should align itself to the different experiences, the different relationships to the context. And the best example is the facade of San Giovanni Battista in Florence by Giovanni Michelucci. Because it's located next to a highway, so the facade moves according to how people are seeing it. So if you are seeing it from the highway, you have a very striking view. Uh, because when we are driving at 100 kilometers per hour, you need to have a building that is impacting. But then when you have the main, uh, the, the, the pedestrian approach, then you have a big entrance as, and, and the building, the facade is more calm and quiet because you are approaching it at a low place. So it has more detail uh, and it more elements combined together. So. This is what we mean by relating to context. And this context is the city, the landscape, or, and the cities, the cityscape. So when you work with call, context, the idea is the facade reacts to the surrounding elements. This is the Zayda apartment building in Granada by Alvaro Siza. And what happens is this building is facing a, a, one a, um, main street on the right side in front of it it has a big plaza and on on the left side it has garden so the building relates to this by being by by the manipulation of the form so the, the part facing the main plaza it's the highest part of the building and it's, it's like these two towers that that go up why because if the building was too short it would disappear in the plaza. So uh, it has it, it it's trying to be bigger to kind of stand out and 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 uh, go along with the monumentality of the place. As you can see here on the sides, this height is completely artificial. Then on the side face, the main uh, street, it follows the alignment of the other blocks. So it follows the same type of window, the same type of alignment, to kind of merge with it. But then on the side of the garden, that is the second image, it is lower because here the buildings are lower. So the gray area of the building represents the left side that then is going to merge with the white area of the building that represents the right side of the building that is higher. So the, the facade is responding to its surroundings. Another uh, way of dealing with your context is the integrated with nature. This is the Broelberg housing complex. And uh, it's located in a hill, in the top of a hill within a green urban area. And so you can see that the buildings have very large windows facing the landscape, while in the inner courtyard it has much smaller windows because it's facing the inside. And then it also has this brownish color that relates, it's a natural color that relates to its surroundings, while the inside, it has this very orange color because this is in uh, Klirschberg, which is a central European area that doesn't have a lot of light. And so in these areas, it is common to use bright colors to kind of bring some life to buildings because it's, it's cloudy uh, many days of, uh, of the year. And then we have also the collage facade. That is uh, when 
you want to kind of um, complement the surrounding area. So for example, uh, the corner bread building is located in an industrial setting. So what the architects did was creating a facade that has that kind of follows this industrial look. Um, because they didn't thought even if this was a residential building, this is an, an industrial um, area so they use this large openings uh, steel and the colors of the industrial warehouses so it always has this kind of um, industrial look to it and from the front side of facing the main facade they have mainly um, uh, residential studios uh, and then the back part of the building, in a way, try to compensate this exposure and this, this industrial look to it by creating this kind of a mezzanine level where um, the, the units can extend to the outside, uh, having like this kind of neighborhood feel to it within this industrial area. So it's like you are attaching to the building this kind of, and you see it in image two and three, um, this kind of uh, passages and corridors that are meant to give um, a more comfy uh, feeling to this um, very industrial area that happens on the front side of, of the building. So it's almost like a, a secondary facade that was attached to it that is an elevated public space. And it is... Um, important in this case because first of all it creates a distance from the windows that are very big windows it creates the distance from from the building and it also extends the interior space the outside uh, space so it's a public space but that is only accessed by a very small number of units so it's not public sorry it's a semi-public space that has a very um, uh, reduced contact with um, with the street and even between neighbors. So it allows you to almost extend the public, sp the, the interior of the dwelling to the outside, to a place that it's semi-private, but um, still feels like a part of your dwelling. Then you have the approach of um, bringing the inside out or what we call inhabiting the space in between. Um, inhabiting the space in between means how do you mediate the use of this space that it's not indoors and it's outdoors, but it's not indoors and it's not outdoors. So it's where you don't have just a balcony, but you have something that it's more than just a balcony you have something that could be used as a space so the first approach is bringing literally the inside out this is the l'immobile quipus in montpellier is a very interesting project where that was inspired by tree houses so what they did is they have a very common block and then they decided to bring these wood boxes to the outside and literally many of these boxes are just open from the top that's why they are not aligned and they have very small windows to the outside so you have a perfectly private space that is outdoor and people can use it as a dining area of course it's only used in the summer but it is not just a terrace now now it's it's a place of the house that's an outdoor space so you literally bring the inside out then you can blur it. This is what happens in, in the curtain wall house by Shigeru Bam or the Dutch house uh, by OMA. You use these curtains that kind of blur uh, what is inside and what's outside. When they are open, they kind of this a space that is a space of a house, but it's an outside space and when the curtain is closed it's an outdoor space that is very private and when the curtain is closed it's an outside space that is very public but it's still the private space of of the house another possibility is what we call the dissolving facade that is when we have the terraces and balconies that are kind of protected by the the shell of the building so it allows you to a certain level of privacy 
and you you kind of start decomposing the facade to bring natural light and 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 ventilation to the terrace areas but they are not just balconies that step out they, they are recessed areas that have a higher level of privacy so it's almost like you have a space that it's outdoor it's in it's outdoor but it's part of the area of the dwelling and you, you feel it like that so it, it's like dissolving the the private space into the outside then you can extend to your surroundings even this is very similar to the blurring in areas where you can do it so for example in this case only in areas that are very isolated in contact with nature you can complete com make completely glazed facades that allow you to communicate to the outside but the problem is when you do that you have to be very careful with issues of privacy in this case it's almost like the surroundings are entering your your building it's almost like there is no separation between in and out it's almost like you are sitting your living room you are sitting in the forest but the problem of this type of solution is that on one hand it can be extremely nice is extremely pleasant but it might also have a problem of privacy so you can only do it when you are sure that first of all the people that you are designing from will accept this and second that you will not have excessive problems of uh, privacy in this case in the forest Trust apartment building in zurich the building is designed as you can see in the last images on the right the building is designed to kind of block the view so when you enter the building you have a series of planes that don't allow Allow you to see the view and then only when you reach the main spaces of the house you have this open view so there is this contrast uh, between um, being enclosed and and being open and um, that it's uh, because that is important because then when you reach the the bedrooms or the living areas you have this feeling that's almost like the the building is extended to its surround almost like there is no boundary then there is also the option of demarcating the inside from out and this is what you do for example in the kawachunga kachanjunga tower uh, by charles korea that is the balconies are perfectly defined they are recessed in the building so it's a perfectly defined space but it, they are big enough to be a place so it's a very big double height areas that have a size that can be used for different functions you, you can have gatherings there have dinner sit outside when the weather is nice so it's not just a simple uh, a small balcony but it's a space it's a place in the house but it's clearly demarcated from uh, the outside world by by its geometrical form and then you can also have the dynamic facade that is when you use the balconies to create movement in the building whenever uh, students want to create a dynamic facade i always tell them don't do it with the walls of the flat use it with the balconies that is the easiest and more efficient way to create a dynamic facade so as you, if you can see here in the marco polo tower it is the balconies that give movement to the building so this way you have balconies that are much more than just a simple balcony so they become large enough to be used as spaces outdoor spaces of the dwelling that can have many different functions but also it allows you to give you different types of size of balconies depending on what you want and to create a dynamic facade and last but not least we have what we call democratic facade the democratic facade is when you want to create a building that allows people to do whatever they want so this is similar to a dressing with layers that is um, the architects dress the building with this um, wood cover they cover but unlike normally attached to the facade uh, in very uh, small balconies in this case it's a layer that is put in f a complete dress that covers the balconies and and the windows and it allows people to open and close the facade independently so 
in this way it's very democratic because each person can do what it wants it's not different it's not very different from um, dressing uh, with layers but um, it's still addressing with layers but it's democratic when you have a facade that where people can open and close it uh, almost uh, uh, as they wish so they can do whatever they want in opening and closing this there are no set of rules it's not like you slide one just one partition no you can open and close all of it and so the the the, the facade becomes very noisy but also very democratic um, so in resume the facades uh, presented often will combine several aspects so sometimes uh, just because we have the scatter grids, they, that doesn't mean they cannot be combined with each other, like I was explaining you in this last example. So um, they often combine several aspects, that is, clad the building, operate within the spatial context of their surroundings, and represent usable space for the residents. I keep talking about the difference between a simple balcony and a place because you always have to think what is the space going to be used for you don't just do balconies just because you have to think about what is the balcony for what is the proper size of the balcony and how much should it be or not exposed to the outside world so these elements these three elements together normally are operated to create different types of situations in the process they repeatedly raise the fundamental question of the essence of the elements door and though their design manifests the complex multi-layered relationship between the individual and society in accordance with the given cultural context meaning it's not just to create a balcony or a window it's what is the size of the window should it be covered or not what is the size of the balcony what is it going to be used for and do i need to cover it or not who what am i seeing when i look outside so this is what determines the type of facade that you are going to use not just a placement of windows randomly because then it means that you are not doing your job properly and this is for this week. Uh, here is your weekly question six. If you want to practice, um, just try to identify the type of thresholds uh, that exist in the ground floor and the type of facade composition of your uh, international and local case studies. And that will help you a lot to practice. Um, just as a note, the material of lecture three, four, and five that, like I said, they make a combination a group of what i call the second part of your housing course that is how to how to design um, it will be addressed in a home study support that is a simple quiz for you to practice and it's based on these weekly questions that i gave you so good morning and i'll see you next time